Hello, everyone. Uh, I, I am hoping that I won't get interrupted while I am recording a lecture that we had today. So again, my apologies. It wasn't my intention. Um, in addition, uh, I just checked E-class and it's under maintenance, which means I cannot probably upload it maybe now, maybe in a few hours. Uh, so that might be delayed a few hours, not because of me, just because of E-class. In addition, um, I just looked syllabus and I was pretty sure that I wrote correct dates in a main syllabus that I uploaded last night. But what happened is probably some of you um, downloaded it before I made changes. So um, I will go at the end of this lecture, I will go through syllabus deadlines for all assignments so you can make sure that you have everything. Mm. Uh, and let's, uh, let's start with... Um... PowerPoint sharing. Um, so we already talked about, and this will be a brief recap for those people who were here. Um, so we'll talk about formation in the early history of Earth. Now, so here is what are we going to talk about more in deep in this lecture. So we will talk about all possible conditions under which life was formed on Earth. Then we will cover processes that gave rise to the first cellular life. And then, then we'll, we will talk about divergence of cellular life into two evolutionary lines, which are bacteria and archaea. So the last but not least, we will cover the process of endosymbiosis, because after you had bacteria and archaea splitting into two different evolutionary lines, those eukarya, which we belong to, developed through endosymbiosis, which we will cover in next lecture. Uh, so in terms of origin of Earth, um, there are data that show, data from slow decaying radioactive isotopes, that Earth was formed 4.5 billion years ago. So that's only the moment when Earth was formed, but that is not the moment when life was formed on Earth. Now, one problem with microbial life, which I probably forgot to mention, is that they actually don't live fossils like uh, animals or plants. So we can only conclude so much from uh, microbial, from, from microbial fossils in rocks, which we will mention later. Now, back to the topic. So how the Earth was formed. So basically, there was that massive old star, and then supernova from that massive old star released some dust and gases. Now, those dust and gases, again, from that old star, created something called disc-shaped nebular cloud. So imagine the process that goes over that. So basically, all dust and gases and forming a disc-shaped nebular cloud. Now, in that cloud, sun was formed, and sun is our star, and it's a source of energy for many microbes, and also for us. I mean, no, we cannot live on, we cannot do photosynthesis, but we do need sun for various life activities, and we like it. Uh, now, sun started to compact, underwent nuclear fusion, and released a large, um, large amounts of heat and light energy. Then, after sun was formed, there were some leftovers in that nebular cloud. And when those leftovers were, were exposed to gravitation, there were some collisions also happening. So basically, gravitation collision, and all those leftovers start to clamp and fuse. This fusion and clamping gave the rise to the planet. So in summary, you will have massive old star, supernova, released gases and dust created this shaped nebular cloud. This is the basis for sun that forms in that disk shaped nebular cloud. Sun started to compact, release heat and light. All those leftovers were exposed to the gravitation, clumping and fusing, and this clumping and fusing gave rise to the planet. And one of those planets is the Earth where we are now. That all happened 4.5 billion years ago. Now, uh, during the uh, during the process of planet forming, energy energy was basically released and uh, and heated that emerging Earth. Why that matters? Well, that that matters because at that time Earth was a very hot planet, so it wasn't suitable for life, and there was no life at the time. Over time, Earth was cooling down, and that led to the formation of thick lower density crust on the surface. So Earth was cooling down, now it's becoming more better for life. So basically, 
for next 500 million years. So all so from 4.5 to 4 billion years ago, Earth was inhospitable. So nothing was there. So that was pretty much very unstable environment. That's why there was no life. So rock from the, rocks from this period are not found because they probably went through metamorphosis, through geological changes. So what's happening with the microbial life on Earth? Again, uh, how we know that? Well, we know that from fossilized cells in rocks because the, the scientists found some, uh, iso so they did uh, isotopic labeling of carbon and sulfur and because they found isotopic uh, isotopes of carbon and sulfur in rocks and those are macromolecules, those are indicators of early microbial life. So if I ask you uh, what would be, how, how you know that there was a life that was an early microbial life on Earth four billion years ago, you will say that you know that because there were carbon and sulfur in rocks that were found through isotopic labeling. And that's how we know that microbes exist then in life because carbon and sulfur are micromolecules, so they're basic molecules of life. Now, uh, there are rocks that are old 3.5 billion years ago. Some of them are younger, but they, so those rocks that, that tend to have 3.5 billion years or little younger, they do have some evidences of microbial life. So we call them microbial formation stromatolites. So what are stromatolites? And stromatolites are important. And I will ask you to know this. So these stromatolites are fossilized microbial mass. So fossilized microbes, stromatolites. stromatolites. They uh, contain some filamentous prokaryotes that are trapped in those sediments. So pretty much those are the oldest microbial evidence, evidences of microbial life, stromatolites. They can be found very often in marine, ba in marine basins and hot springs. Um, some of them are very old, ancient stromatolites, and ancient stromatolites are formed by phototrophic organisms, while those younger or modern stromatolites are formed by phototrophic or oxygen-evolving bacteria. And you will see later in, in this lecture and later in class why this matters. This only matters so you can understand which type of metabolism was present on Earth uh, in which time, because that really depends on compounds and chemicals that were available on the, in the, on the earth at the time. So if we talk about uh, origin of cellular life, we can ask basically two questions. How this first cell maybe arose and how that cell looks? And there are three hypotheses. Some of them have more sense than another, uh, but I will end up with the one that has more sense and that was that is currently established as a, as a correct one. So the first hypothesis is surface, second one subsurface origin hypothesis is, and last, but apparently not least, is RNA world and protein synthesis hypothesis, which we will cover in this class. Now, so what surface origin of life means? So that basically means, so the way how it's constructed that is that there was a primordial soup that in large pond that contained organic and inorganic compounds. Easy to imagine, uh, but how the life evolved. So how it's hypothesized is that the first membrane enclosed self-replicating cell, and remember, in order to have a cell, you have to have membrane enclosed structure. So the first membrane enclosed structure spontaneously developed from that primordial soup full of inorganic and organic compounds. Is that possible? So there are some evidences that that might have that it is possible to get some spontaneous formation of cell or organic precursors under certain conditions. However, there is always however. Remember that I said that life uh, that um, uh, the Earth was very inhospitable. There were there was fluctuating temperature, dust, clouds, storms. So this theory probably is unlikely. Just uh, Earth was not suitable for life. So can something really develop from in, in that unstable area? Likely not. But in terms of subsurface hypothesis, everything started beneath the ocean floor, subsurface. And this makes more sense. Here is the thing. You will have those hydrothermal vents that are beneath the surface. And there, conditions are way more stable. 
So there are many abundant organic uh, inorganic compounds like uh, hydrogen and hydrogen sulfide. So both hydrogen and hydrogen sulfide are sources of energy. Those are highly reduced compounds and bacteria and organisms can use it to extract energy and create all compounds that they need to survive. Now, think about that, that below the surface, there was a hot water, like very hot and alkaline water and many, many reduced compounds. Now, what's happening is that ocean water is acidic and contains iron. So what you have currently are very important compounds for development of microbial life. You have hydrogen, you have hydrogen sulfide, you have iron, and you have differences in saline, in um, acidity of water. Now, so when this alkaline hot water from beneath the surface mixes with cold acidic ocean water on the surface, and that water contains water contains iron. So th think about that. You have hydrogen, you have hydrogen sulfide beneath. It's very hot. It's alkaline. Goes through the crust goes into the when 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 the when there is like a cold acidic area where there are irons. So you have irons sulfides. So you already have compounds that are required so you can create life, which you will see later through course bacteria can use these compounds to create energy. Now um, basically when these two types of waters mix and there is an iron there, iron interacts with uh, uh, various minerals, and you get uh, compounds like pyrites, silicates, carbonates, and magnesium. So iron sulf sulfide FeS2 is your pyrite. So this was the basic or subsurface hypothesis. Now, you will have, you, you ended up with formed minerals of iron. Iron is from the surface you get sulfur from beneath the surface. So you have those iron, uh, iron and nickel. And I used iron as example, but there was also another metal nickel. So iron sulfides. So these sulfides uh, are now going to catalyze formation of amino acids, simple peptides, sugars, and bases. So pretty much you have all simple molecules that are formed due to catalyzation with these uh, irons and sulfides. So now these sulfides will concentrate all these now molecular compounds. So those are all molecules required for life. And there will be a phosphate from seawater because it's highly abundant. And this phosphate will help to form nucleotides as they are polymerized into RNA. So RNA is our next point of view, RNA world and protein synthesis. So what you're going to do there, what you have to understand here is that uh, currently we believe that RNA is actually the molecule that was the oldest one and RNA is what actually established development of all other molecules. And there are uh, evidences that show that. So um, when we talk about RNA, um, we, we, we have to, so let, let's think about this. So. RNA is that catalytic molecule that actually helped to uh, self-replicating systems to arise. So that's prebiotic chemistry. So, okay, how that happened? So in this early RNA world, mm. the first self-replicating system was molecule of RNA. Molecule of RNA can self-replicate. It is ribonucleic acid. So uh, RNA was fragile. So you would say that some people might think that RNA is too unstable to be precursor for everything else. But if you think about how Earth looked in that period, so even though RNA is fragile, it's possible that in those porous formations, RNA could be embedded and survive, like in the ocean floors. So, and it has catalytical activities. So RNA does have catalytical activities, even though it's ribonucleic acid. It also binds small molecules like ATP. ATP is a source of energy for life. So it is possible that RNA did catalyze first its own formation from all available sugars, bases, and phosphates. We know RNA can also bind amino acids. So RNA basically was the first one that 
catalyzed formation of primitive simple proteins. Even though we always think of, uh, when we talk about central dogma of molecular biology, we think from the point of DNA, RNA, protein. So, so before RNA, yeah, so, you, and we think about proteins as a biological catalyzers, and they are now, but initially RNA was the one that catalyzed its own formation and formation of primitive proteins. So then, thanks to the RNA, different proteins were made on Earth, and uh, those early proteins literally coated the surface of those pyrites, carbonates, and, um, uh, and silicates. So those prebiotic chemistries. Um, so you see, if once when you have proteins that and uh, that uh, code something, you pretty much have a function of semi-permeable membrane, right? So it is some sort of origin of some some life. So it is possible. It makes sense. Now we already have something that looks like semi-permeable membrane. Many proteins arose and they took it over catalytically well. Now, eventually, because DNA is more stable than RNA, it, DNA took over the role of repository of genetic material. Now, this system, DNA, RNA, protein, now became fixed in cellular evolution as basically the best solution for information proce processing. Next thing that we are missing, information of cell, and remember, you have to have some cell, something that encloses biological material. So you are missing lipids. You do have proteins made by RNA. You have development of DNA from RNA and taking it over because it's more stable. Now lipids. So basically lipids uh, uh, are next important step in building a cellular life. So you have to build phospholipid B layer. Uh, so precursors for phospholipid B layer were membrane vesicles. Yeah. And those membrane uh, vesicles um, had one purpose. So they had a purpose for nutrient intake or taking the waste out of cell. Uh, so those lipids, lipid protein structures, form semi-permeable structures. And this set the stage of evolution for energy conserving processes such as ATP synthesis. Now, in summary, so this picture is actually giving very nice overview of everything that we were talking about. So first self-replicating organism might be formed after, first self uh, may, might be formed after lipoprotein structure and trapped DNA and RNA. So this population of first self-replicating organisms, so after the, this lipids and proteins developed, so proteins are developed by RNA and trapped nucleic acid. So this early population is the last universal common ancestor or LUCA. And this is something that I would really like to know. LUCA, last universal common ancestor, ancestor that but it's early population of cells, first self-replicating organism that was formed after lipoprotein structure and trapped DNA and RNA. So definition of LUCA is something that you would have to know. Now, after cellular life evolved, after this, after LUCA was formed, then cellular life evolved in different directions in terms of lipid biosynthesis. So bacteria and archaea have different ways of lipid biosynthesis, which we'll see in next slide. So these two branches gave bacteria and archaea. And um, Mm, this this is the next slide that I was talking about. So the indicator of this early divergence that gave two evolutionary lineages is um, the stereochemistry of both organisms. So in bacteria, phospholipids uh, will contain the literal backbone where phosphate is attached to the uh, third carbon atom, so down, fully down. But, um, but in archaea, it will contain backbone made of literal one phosphate. So stereochemistry is slightly different. This uh, indicates that uh, synthesis of membrane lipids evolved differently and synthesized different molecules in bacteria and archaea. And uh, go, uh, now moving uh, forward with early metabolism. So who was the first? What was the first? So now we know uh, technically, we know all three hypotheses, surface, subsurface, RNA world, and RNA hypothesis. And we do know that 
likely that uh, RNA world makes most sense, that RNA was the first molecule that appeared, survived in those porous structures in beneath the ocean floor, catalyzed formation of proteins. So we know all of that. And we know that uh, first, first uh, self-replicated organism developed when those lipoproteins entrapped DNA and RNA. So now we have that LUCA, last universal common ancestor, and then we have bacteria and archaea. So what happened after that? So it happened that bacteria and archaea, or microbes, and later on we will mention eukaryotes, their separate lineage, they had to evolve and so they had to learn how to live with what they had on Earth at the time. So that's how the early metabolism was developed. So how was the early Earth and ocean? Anoxic. Anoxic means no oxygen. Uh, we will come later to that point, but oxygen didn't happen up to like 2 billion years ago. So it's, and Earth, uh, Earth appeared in 4.5 billion years ago. So early conditions on Earth were anoxic. So there was no molecular oxygen. Mm. Significant amounts of oxygen appeared when cyanobacteria evolved. Cyanobacteria are bacteria that use photosynthesis, so sunlight energy, they oxidize water and release oxygen. So when they generate oxygen, then we had a big, big, big oxygenation event, and that's when other life form evolves. So, uh, as I said previously, I do want you to know these four stages in Earth, evol in Earth evolution. So Hadean, Archean, Proterozoic, Phanerozoic. Uh, I am not very picky about the dates. I do want you guys to know the concept more than dates. So yes, it's, I don't think it's hard to memorize that 4.5 billion years ago formation of Earth occurred. Uh, and then 4 billion years ago, the first cell of life appeared, Luca. Then 3.5 billion years ago, no, those purple and green bacteria, which are uh, non-oxygen, so they are photosynthetic organisms, uh, but they are different. This is a different type of photosynthesis, so it's not the same type of photosynthesis like cyanobacteria are doing. Again, we will cover that in later lectures. So then 3.5 billion years ago, they appear. So that's what I would like you to know. So I would like you to know that after Luca. So after the divergence happened, first metabolism, first of all, was uh, pretty much dependent on what was available on Earth, and there was no oxygen, which means that those organisms have to evolve to live without oxygen. And those organisms were purple and green bacteria. And there is, no, there is one caveat there, which I will cover in next slide. So again, you, I don't really want to bother with numbers, but after purple and green bacteria, there were cyanobacteria, so when cyanobacteria evolved, then they made oxygen. And when they increased the amount of oxygen, that happened. So when oxygen accumulated in enough amounts, that was 2.5 billion years ago, that was great oxidation event. And then after enough oxygen was there, that supported the development of third lineage, which are eukarya. And uh, in terms of Phanerozoic era, I would just like you guys to know that this was the period when uh, multicellular eukaryotes appeared and after that animals developed. So I do want you guys to know the concepts. And I don't think it's really hard once when you understand how uh, how Earth looked in terms of uh, in terms of environment, like what was present there. Because whatever was present there shapes um, shapes how the shape, shapes the evolution and later on diversity of microbial life. Um, so basically, in Hadean and the first half of Archean, dominant metabolism was metanogenesis. So that's one caveat to this one. So here I said purple and green bacteria 3.5 billion years ago. Again, we cannot determine exactly, but metanogenesis is older older than uh, an oxygenic photosynthesis. Then in second half of Archean, oxygenic photosynthesis appear. Oxygen, so that's what's when cyanobacteria made oxygen. And the great oxidation event is beginning of Proterozoic era, which was followed by ozone shield formation. Now when that, so there was oxygen, there was ozone shield. Ozone 
prevents UV lights to uh, burn to, to emit radiation, so ozone was protecting shield. And now when the oxygen level reached that 20% that we have now, um, multiple uh, multicellular eukaryotes appear. And early animals formed just before beginning of Cambrian period uh, when dinosaurs arose. So I'm not going to ask about animals, that's for sure. I will ask only about microbes. So what was the early metabolism? So it was anaerobic, definitely. There was no oxygen, possible autotrophic. Autotrophic means they could fix carbon dioxide. So basically what those organisms could do, they could literally consume abiotically formed organic compounds as a carbon source and build cellular material. So whatever was there, they can consume. Again, they learn how to do it. So early autotrophic lifestyle uh, is confirmed by discovery of bacteria named Aquifex. And this bacteria is important. I do want you guys to know that this is hyperthermophilic bacteria with very small genome that uh, whose dis and discovery of this bacteria confirmed the existence of early autotrophic lifestyle on planet Earth. Now, in summary, First cell might be anaerobic and autotrophic, so fixing of, and it can obtain carbon from carbon dioxide. And where would electrons come to reduce carbon dioxide? So newly, new evidences suggest that that original molecule, the oldest one was hydrogen, and hydrogen is highly reduced. And in one of the lectures, I will talk about that. I will talk about specifically bacteria that consume hydrogen and that are hyperthermophilic. Now, in order to have this um, this early microbial life that is anaerobic, autotrophic, oxidizes hydrogen, reduces carbon dioxide. So what would you have to have on Earth on the time? You would have to have constant supplies of hydrogen dioxide, of, of hydrogen. Yes, we do have that. We know where it comes from. We talked about in, beneath the ocean floor, there was also hydrogen. So... Apparently, there was hydrogen. Nitrogen was available. Phosphorus, yes, minerals. So this is, and this type of organism would have to produce acetate from uh, as a waste from hydrogen oxidation and carbon dioxide reduction. So the question for you that you will see in the next slide is, is there any organism currently on Earth that was isolated that can oxidize hydrogen, reduce carbon dioxide, which would be like anaerobic autotrophic lifestyle? Yes. So there are hyperthermophilic archaea that can oxidize hydrogen, they reduce elemental sulfur, and hydrogen comes from, um, again, available compounds in the earth, it came from over there, so where it came from, so you remember that there, there is a hydrogen sulfate, um, so in the reaction between hydrogen sulfate in, in certain minerals, we can get hydrogen, so there was hydrogen there, and hydrogen is known as a powerful electron donor, and it can generate protomotive force. And protomotive force could turn on formation of primitive ATPases to yield ATP. Uh, now, moving on. So once when you have electron donor, which is hydrogen, there is a need for electron acceptor. So um, if you are not very familiar with that, um, see me, I can, this, I can explain it in details, but I am not going to ask you to know about microbial physiology in this class that's for my other class so uh, you will have uh, so so you need to have each electron donor requires having an electron acceptor so you can get proper redox pair something is oxidized something gets reduced so electron acceptor was probably elemental sulfur mm. again abundant on earth just think about what was there that's all what you need to know so with oxidation of hydrogen and reduction of sulfate you form hydrogen sulfide. Now, uh, now you have hydrogen, you have hydrogen sulfide. Both of these compounds are highly reduced and they are constant supply of energy on Earth. So uh, basically, this is that early chemolithotrophic metabolism, like with all those now formed uh, inorganic compounds. And the, this can, these compounds can, can support the production of organic compounds from autotrophic carbon dioxide fixation because you will have supply of energy, hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide came from reactions between um, 
available hydrogen uh, and um, mineral. So, and you will have sulfur there. So definitely you have now a redox pair. You can produce carbon, you can, you can produce energy. There is carbon dioxide. They can fix carbon dioxide. So basically that can, so with, from all these inorganic compounds, you can get organic compounds, organic material, and that organic material gave abundant, diverse, and constantly renewed sources of new reduced organic compounds that other microbes learn how to utilize. So basically, microbes are known as the chemists of the world. So they change the chemistry of Earth. They form different uh, compounds that other microbes use, and then other microbes uh, develop, like, evolve to utilize those compounds. So basically, the availability, this is a conclusion of reduced organic compounds, trigger the evolution of a variety of bacteria with different metabolic strategies. And in the next unit, uh, we will talk about metabolic diversity of bacteria. So apparently, microbial life went through extensive process of metabolic diversification. And as I said, microbes will utilize whatever was available. So they literally take advantage of all available resources. And as I said, microbes are chemists of the world, so they alter chemistry. And as they are altering existing chemistry, they create new chemicals that can be used by newly comer, like newly evolving organisms, and that will result in enormous diversification. Um, now, in terms of early bacteria, we already said, and I'm repeating this constantly because I do want you to understand that uh, hydrogen was likely the first uh, first electron source, the first energy-containing compound that was used. Likely carbon dioxide was uh, fixed, was the electron acceptor. So when something fixed carbon dioxide, that's called autotro auto that's autotrophic organism. So from oxidation of hydrogen and reduction of carbon dioxide, you can produce acetate. And those early bacteria were also able to use um, ferrocyons, so ferros 2 plus, um, to generate energy. So why this matters? So you had hydrogen as one source of energy, but there is iron 2 plus, and it's important to be iron 2 plus because that's highly reduced. It has a lot of electrons that uh, bacteria or archaea can extract, but then they have something to breathe. So they have to have electron acceptor. Usually that would be sulfur. And that's constant, again, you have a constant supply of energy. Um, early archaea used only hydrogen and carbon dioxide. So in summary, you had those bacteria that were able to mm, utilize and hydrogen and reduce iron as energy source. They were able to fix carbon dioxide, so to use a carbon dioxide as an electron acceptor. So literally, they're fixing it. So it's autotrophy, so anaerobic autotrophy. And they also could use elemental sulfur. So you technically have two energy sources and two electron donors and two electron acceptors for bacteria. For archaea, you had hydrogen and carbon dioxide. And this is the process called methanogenesis, which is older. And though that's very unique to archaea. Methanogens are archaea. So all these metabolic events that I just talked about with uh, hydrogen, with reduced iron, um, carbon dioxide fixation and elemental sulfur reduction, that all happened 4.1 or like 3.9 billion years ago. So think about that. After, so you have, basically you have uh, life formed you have uh, earth formed and then as you are moving forward all these metabolic events were happening probably around three point billion years ago so right after luca now phototrophy is younger so uh, this um, light like utilization of light is 3.2 billion years ago so those unoxygenic photosynthetic bacteria that was first so before oxygenic but methanogenesis and hydrogen utilization is older. So yes, this is what you would like, that I would like you to know that uh, methanogenesis that's done by Archaea is very old process and it preceded photosynthesis, even unoxygenic photosynthesis. Uh, and these are some examples that I would like you guys to uh, understand.
probably to memorize aquifex is very important um, to that hyperthermophilic bacteria that we mentioned in previous slides. So the evidence of early life and thermato thermotoga, they are early branches of hyperthermophilic bacteria. So those two were the oldest one. And chloroflexus is common ancestor for all bacteria. And this was so for bac uh, basically for all bacteria which are anaerobic phototrophs, chloroflexus was common ancestor. ancestor. Uh, but aquifex and thermatoga, they are earlier branch because they are hyperthermophilic bacteria that oxidize hydrogen. So aquifex thermatoga before chloroflexus. Cyanobacteria are way above, much younger, evolved 2.7 billion years ago when they learned how to run photosynthesis with water instead of hydrogen sulfide, which was which was done uh, which was done previously. Now, instead of releasing uh, sulfur, unoxygenic uh, un oxygenic cyanobacteria release oxygen. So this was big oxygenic event, and that um, happened 2.2 billion years ago. After cyanobacteria um, produce enough oxygen. Now, uh, this rise of oxygen is um, related to these uh, structures called banded iron formations. So, um, again, I, as I said, uh, cyanobacteria appeared 2.7 billion years ago. But then oxygen did not accumulate uh, enough in another 300 million years. So the question is why? Why oxygen took so long to build up? Well, oxygen took long to build up because uh, oxygen that cyanobacteria made uh, interacted with reduced iron compounds like that were abundant, like iron sulfide. Uh, and in this reaction, oxygen will get reduced while iron 2 plus will be oxidized and form this iron ferric ion 3 plus. Why that matters? Because that uh, ferric iron can form iron oxides and that, that those iron oxides are those, uh, oxides are those banded iron formations and they entrap oxygen, so it prevents their accumulation. Basically, if I if I ask you what prevented oxygen accumulation, you will say that abundant iron, abundant highly reduced iron prevented oxygen accumulation after cyanobacteria start producing it. Once when that reduced iron uh, was exhausted, oxygen started accumulating. Uh, and there were no more banded iron formations. Now, new metabolism and ozone shield. So oxygen, as we know, accumulated, and now Earth has been changed from anoxic to oxic. Bacteria and archaea, as we know, are now adapted to anoxic areas. So those bacteria that learn how to use um, how to use hydrogen and how to use reduced iron and how to fix carbon dioxide and archaea that use hydrogen and fix carbon dioxide, they don't like oxygen, they are anoxic. So why so why why that matters? Well when oxygen when oxygen level increased, oxygen was oxidizing all those reduced compounds this, that those bacteria and their here uh, could use. So they were very limited. So they could not really evolve. So they stayed over there. They still they they stayed in anoxic areas. So they just didn't like the oxygen because the oxygen would take all compounds that they need. Now um, Earth also created conditions that led to evolution of new metabolic pathways. Now you have sulfate reduction, nitrification, and iron oxidation. So you literally have new meta new metabolic diversification after oxygen appeared. So there was a rise of bacteria that can use oxygen either facultatively or mandatory. So as you know, the, the, there are those type of bacteria. Uh, and these mixed organisms gain the advantage. So they could, they could oxidize organic compounds and gain more ener energy than anaerobic could, which is the reason why they overgrew them. Now, the rise of oxygen Mm, rapid is basically the, the sign of rapid evolution. So after so after oxygen increased, rapid evolution happened. And you got eukaryote separation, then multicellular eukaryotes, and later on early animals. Formation of ozone is very important, O3, because um, ozone provides barrier as a protection from 
UV radiation from sun. So when oxygen generated by cyanobacteria interacts with UV from sun, it creates ozone. Ozone absorbs UV lights up to 300 nanometers. So until ozone appeared, evolution could only happen where? Well, beneath the ocean surface and in very protected areas where uh, lights were not exposed to sun. So once when you had that protection, everything increased rapidly and on the surface. So uh, I believe that it's clear now in terms of bacteria and archaea, what was the oldest, what was the youngest. So again, we will I will mention this multiple times to multiple times through class. So we do know that bacteria and archaea evolved from LUCA, last universal common ancestor, two lineages. Okay. They went through very strong process of metabolic diversification, and that um, metabolic diversification was developed based on the available compounds on Earth at the time, mostly anoxic, anaerobic. Earth bio, so, af so after cyanobacteria uh, evolved and uh, created enough oxygen, so when all iron was uh, all reduced iron was exhausted, no more banded iron formation. There is a lot of oxygen, so Earth went through major changes. So basically, everything it changes after oxygen showed up. At the time, all cells were lacking membrane and closed organelles, so that means that all cells were prokaryotics. Uh, but now, when cells get uh, enclosed membrane organelles, they become eukaryotic cells, because that's the main difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Prokaryotes do not have enclosed organelles. Now, uh, in terms of origin of eukaryotes, uh, they are very separate line, and we will cover a few of examples in this class. So they are very young. They appeared two billion years ago. So after everything else, after bacteria, after archaea. So the origin of eukaryotes happened after the rise of atmospheric oxygen, and who made it? Cyanobacteria. So basically, the invention of this respiratory metabolism. So respiratory metabolism means mm, that bacteria can breathe oxygen, uh, and the development of uh, superoxidase mutates help to detoxify toxic oxygen species. And that's what happened before eukaryotes. So basically, they have, to serve, they have to adapt to the existing oxygen amount in the atmosphere. So how that happened? How did they develop? So basically, that those, those would be questions that we would ask. So Apparently, this available oxygen affected the evolution of eukaryotes a lot. So how that happened? Let's see. So theory of endosymbiosis. And this is probably that you already heard about in other classes. And I really love this theory of endosymbiosis. And I will exactly tell you what is important for you to memorize uh, from endosymbiotic theory. So if you think about eukaryotic cell, you have to think about all organelles and mitochondria and chloroplasts of modern uh, eukaryotes arose from a stable incorporation into another type of chemoorganotrophic bacterium. Now, this bacterium carried facultative aerobic metabolism, so could survive on oxygen, but could live without it. And another type of bacterium was in that was incorporated was cyanobacterium. So cyanobacterium was eaten, and then it created photosynthesis, uh, oxygenic photosynthesis. If you think about plastids in plants, that's what chloroplast is. And we will see evidences in one of next slides. Now, this oxygen is very important for symbiosis. So ancestor mitochondria consumed large amount of oxygen. So basically, one cell entrapped another, like mitochondria, cell entrapped um, mm, uh, cyanobacteria, and that's how you gain that's how you gain um, organelles into the eukaryotes. So that's why it's called endosymbiosis. Mm. Now, uh, significant so, so uh, ancestor chloroplast actually. So if you think about what's the difference between mitochondrial because bacteria uh, mitochondrial chloroplasts are both bacteria. So if you think about um, Ancestor mitochondria, that chemoorganotrophic bacterium, that consumes large, that bacterium consumes large amounts of oxygen. So in mitochondria, is you have electron transport chain. So if you think about eukaryotic cells, so that's not, but bacterial electron transport chain. 
And now, if, so basically you have energy consumption. And if you think about ancestral floropus, they produced a large amount of oxygen in their energy metabolism. So you basically have two events here. Aerobic respiration in mitochondria or chemorganotrophic bacterium that was eaten by another organism, that over there you will see release of larger amounts of energy. And in event two, in um, chloroplasts, actually cyanobacteria that were engulfed, they have ability to use energy from sun. So spending and production of energy. So it's all about the energy. So both of these events, consummation and production of energy, contributed to the rapid evolution of eukaryotes. The overall structure of both mitochondria and chloroplasts supports this theory of endosymbiosis. And these four, um, these four points are very important for you to understand and to memorize literally for this class. So if I ask you uh, what supports the theory of endosymbiosis, you will tell me or write me, probably write me, that first reason is that both mitochondria and chloroplasts contain ribosomes. Ribosomes in them are bacterial types. They, that means bacterial type means they have 70S uh, sedimentation constant and 16S rRNA is same as prokaryotes. So that's all. So basically mitochondria and chloroplasts are bacteria. Then another evidence is that same antibiotics that affect ribosomal function in bacteria inhibit ribosomal function in mitochondria and chloroplasts. That's the second evidence. Mitochondria and chloroplasts also have their own DNA, which is arranged the same like in bacteria. So they have independent genome. You can you probably heard about that. And many on and on the other side, there are many signs of bacteria present on eukaryotic organelles. So those four, especially these three evidences about uh, ribo prokaryotic type of ribosomes uh, with 16S rRNA, which is identical, uh, antibiotics that affect uh, ribosomal function uh, in, uh, in bacteria are the same like those that affect in mitochondria and chloroplasts, and both organs contain their, or their own DNA. Now, I hope this was clear. I believe that you already heard about endosymbiosis, it's quite famous. Now, the question is, what was the nature of the cell that acquired those mitochondria and later chloroplasts? So if you think about that first mitochondria was some chemoorganotrophic bacteria, chloroplasts was cyanobacteria. So who took them? So, and then the other question is, where did nuclear membrane came from? And there are a few theories, and uh, since it's not, at least in book, it's not very well established and clear, I will tell you exactly what's important for, for you to understand. So. There were two hypotheses. So how eukaryotic cell was formed? So hypothesis one basically says that once when early cell arose, DNA material accumulated, nucleus formed spontaneously as material accumulated. So basically, eukary initial eukaryotic cell was, uh, contain was nucleus containing lineage. So everything happened spontaneously. Later, this nucleus containing lineage acquired mitochondria and chloroplasts via symbiosis. So basically, the first hypothesis is that the cell that took mm, mitochondria and chloroplasts that engulfed those type of bacteria had nucleus already. So it was the first nucleus and then um, uh, engulfment happened. Second hypothesis is a little unclear in book, but I will try to uh, explain it here. So hydrogen hypothesis. So basically the hypothesis is that there was early bacteria that uh, uh, was oxygen consuming hydrogen producing. So there was a hydrogen abundance. And then this early bacteria symbiont gave a rise to mitochondria. Mitochondria, but those are bacteria. And the member of archaea. And this member of archaea was the host. The host, archaea, was dependent on, so the host was archaea, and the host was dependent on hydrogen as an energy source, and hydrogen was waste of bacterial metabolism. Okay. So this sort of makes sense 
especially because if you think from a uh, perspective of similarities that exist between eukaryotes and archaea, some similarities are quite extreme. So I would like you just to know basic concepts. But what more important is to know that eukaryotic cell is chimera, so basically made from both bacterial and archaeal cells, so it has characteristics of both. Eukaryotes have a type of lipids that are found in bacteria, but they have transcription and translation more like in archaea. So this is important to know. Transcription, translation, similar to archaea, lipids, similar like bacteria. Energy metabolism, more like bacteria, because mitochondria that were ingested are bacteria. And this development of eukaryotic cell was the major step in evolution. This was a complex creation of complex genetically chimeric cell. It, this cell was powered by uh, mitochondria. Mitochondria are literally the motor of the cell. So that's the place where ATP is generated. And in phototrophs, uh, there are energy generating chloroplasts. And this, um, so this table is, in my opinion, very important summary that uh, I would really like you to pay attention. So I will never ask you to list me all of these components, but I might give you a table and ask you to fill it up. So it once when you understand the relationships between three lineages, it shouldn't be hard to fill this up. So bacteria and archaea have very different lipids. So that's the evidence of divergence, like glycerol 3 phosphate, glycerol 1 phosphate. Bacteria have ester linked, archaea have ether linked. Eukaryotes are similar like bacteria, they have ester linked. Chlorophyll based photosynthesis does not exist in archaea, but does exist in bacteria and eukaryotes. Histone proteins, on the other hand, exist in archaea and eukaryotes, but not in bacteria. Um, starting or initiated tRNA is in bacteria formal, met formal methionine, but in archaea and eukaryotes, it's methionine. So uh, notice the pat pattern between similarities that exist between eukaryotes and archaea in terms of transcription and translation. RNA polymerases, this is very unique. So bacteria and archaea have only one, while eukaryotes have three. Uh, transcription factors, again, knowing bacteria, but again, transcription translation. Information conservation, similar between archaea and eukarya. Promoter structure, very unique data box in archaea and eukarya. Again, information conservation, while in bacteria, you have only uh, minus 10 and uh, minus 35 uh, uh, primal sequence box, box. And in terms of antibiotics, only bacteria are uh, sensitive on antibiotics. And with this, um, I will stop sharing um, the screen. and. Um, once when e-class is up, I will uh, upload this lecture and I will announce it. And again, syllabus is fine. Uh, just uh, some students downloaded it uh, before last night. And last night I corrected that what was in, um, in grade evaluation. So that's why I made mistake thinking that whatever is in course schedule, I know that Nora and I changed that course schedule. But I also corrected um, uh, grade evaluation um, assignment breakpoints. Just whoever downloaded it, downloaded it probably before. But that's totally fine. My apologies for that. Uh, please feel free to contact me anytime. I will correct whatever you think it's worth of correction. And again, thank you so much for coming. The, there is a possibility uh, that the class will crash again. So. Again, I will announce this uh, on e-class. I will probably pre-record my lecture for Thursday so you don't have to sit in class. You can just listen. I really want to avoid problems that we had today. And uh, apparently, internet connection in this place is highly unstable. And I don't want to put you in problems uh, with interruptions. And then you maybe didn't catch something. It's easier for you for you and for me. And then when I come back, uh, we will have in-person lectures as it was planned uh, initially. Thank you again and see you on Thursday.